None of us can ever fully comprehend the depth of agony the Savior endured through His atonement. And because of that, no one needs to endure their own agony alone. Jesus Christ has been lower than our lows. He has felt despair beyond our despair. And He knowingly and willingly submitted Himself to suffer and die because He knew that it would bring to us purpose from pain, mercy from misery, salvation from sin. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. About a year ago, I went through a really hard time personally and financially, and I'm a single person, and so I really felt alone. I didn't have anything to discuss the issues with and it was it was just very difficult for me when I had felt alone I felt a spirit of comfort and a spirit of peace just to know that there's somebody else with me that it wasn't just me by myself but that Heavenly Father loves me and Jesus loves me and that I was not alone because they were with me I was very grateful that I felt the Lord with me so much even though at first I felt totally alone and abandoned and like the windows of heaven were locked and deadbolted. <laughs> but I really honestly, just when I started to pray, knew that the Lord heard me and knew who I was. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Lomu, and I am your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Jennifer Lane. Jennifer has a PhD in religion with an emphasis in history of Christianity from Claremont Graduate University, was a professor of religious education at BYU Hawaii for 19 years, and is currently part of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. Jennifer, welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And our special guest today is John Hilton III. John has a master's degree from Harvard and a PhD from BYU, both in education. He is a professor of ancient scripture at BYU and is the author of the book, Considering the Cross, How Calvary Connects Us with Christ. John, so good to have you here today. Thanks, Ben. It's a pleasure. And we're also joined by our studio audience. Grateful for you and for being here today as well. And to the viewers at home, we're excited to have you join us about our discussion of Christ's atonement today. We hope you'll follow along and share your own thoughts with us on Facebook and Instagram. Today, we've selected two topics to discuss that relate to passages found in Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19. These topics and discussions support and build upon the Come Follow Me resource developed and published by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The two topics we are going to discuss today are first— Jesus Christ suffered alone, so I don't have to. And second, what the crucifixion teaches me about the character of Christ. After exploring these two topics with our panel and studio audience, we'll let our studio audience go and move on to footnotes, the last segment of the show, where we dive deeper into the topics and scriptures with Jennifer and John. Okay, so on to our first, uh, first topic. And I'm really, really excited about today, uh, partly because of the sacred nature and, and, and partly as well because of just the content of things that we can all learn and how we can grow. So Jennifer, speaking specifically to this first topic about Christ suffering so that we don't have to, what can you tell us about these chapters and what they teach about this first topic? Sure. So these are, are powerful accounts of Christ on the cross. Um, getting here, of course, was a long journey. The last week of his life um, had many events, but it really culminates here. Everything's pointing towards, as, as prophecy had pointed towards, that he would be lifted up upon the cross. And so we see for our salvation, his willingness to submit to, to death um, for our sake. And so these chapters really have a powerful account of, of his suffering and death and his love for us. And John, you've literally written a book on this topic. Uh, can you tell us what are some things that we can look forward to as we dive into these topics with this, uh, with these chapters? Maybe I can start with a story. A few years ago, I was living in Jerusalem with some other colleagues from Brigham Young University, and I was talking with one of them, and he said to me, John, why do you think that 
when we are discussing the atonement of Christ, we tend to focus mostly on Gethsemane. And that was a question that really stuck with me because I had been a seminary teacher and an institute teacher. And whenever I focused on Christ's atonement, I tended to mostly think about Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And so I actually started surveying different groups of students and others, and I found that this was true. For many Latter-day Saints, our focus is on Gethsemane. Then when I went to the scriptures, what I found is that the scriptures heavily emphasize Christ's crucifixion. And the teachings of Joseph Smith and actually later prophets also heavily emphasize Christ's crucifixion. And so I'm excited to study these chapters together because I realized there was a huge part of the Savior's atonement that, honestly, I was kind of gliding by. And so as we understand more fully what happened to Christ on the cross, I think we can feel a greater sense of kinship with him Mm -hmm. in our own deep sufferings. And you mentioned that we can feel that kinship with him because there are times when we do feel alone. So I would just kind of like to start off with the audience and ask, what are some times in your life when you have truly felt alone? Claire. At school, my friends that I used to have, they were really nice. Then all of a sudden, they kind of starting to not be nice. And so I had to switch friend groups. I had a really, really hard time. I felt really lonely. Like I felt like I couldn't trust anyone and I couldn't talk to anyone. In those moments, uh, who did you turn to to kind of feel comforted? I kind of turned to my mom and to the Savior. Uh, You turned to the Savior. What does that look like to turn to the Savior when you're alone? I prayed. You know, I really like what Claire is saying about feeling alone, turn to prayer, because we learned a lot about the Savior in this moment uh, when he was feeling alone and what he did. Jennifer, do you mind kind of uh, talking about the process that he went through and perhaps even why it was necessary for him to feel alone? Sure. And again, kind of following up on John's point about Gethsemane and Christ on the cross, that we know from accounts in in Luke 22, where where Christ is praying in Gethsemane, he actually has an angel come to comfort and strengthen him. And so there's this time where he he feels that comfort. But on the cross, we have accounts of of him, like this passage here in Mark 15, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what's fascinating about this is it has these two levels that he's, he's sort of this, his heart is crying out to his father, but he's also quoting scripture. Mm. This is the beginning of Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm. And so in the one sense, he's fulfilling scripture, but I think he's also witnessing to the people around him. He's feeling, so in his moment of deepest abandonment, he's also testifying that he's the Messiah by wow. quoting scripture, a messianic scripture that people would know. So he wants them to know who he is, why he's doing what he's doing, giving us confidence when we feel this, that we're not alone mm-hmm. because he's been there with us. He's come down to, to experience what we are experiencing in mortality. John, we had a question coming from one of our viewers that I think you'll be able to help answer. So if we can turn and watch and see what they are asking and how uh, we can help answer this question. Hi, my name is Doug from West Jordan, Utah. My question is, if the Savior had already suffered for the sin, the pain, and sickness of the world in Gethsemane, why then did he also have to endure the additional torment of death through crucifixion? Was there any particular reason he was subjected to this agonizing means of death, or could any other way still have satisfied the demands of justice and the atonement? Thank you. A lot of times we think about Christ on the cross, and sometimes maybe we try to separate what happened on the cross from what happened in Gethsemane. I've heard a lot of people say something like, well, Jesus overcame spiritual death. He suffered for our sins in Gethsemane. And then separately, he overcame physical death on the cross. Mm -hmm. Elder Gerald Lund called that a doctrinal error. And he said that doesn't appear in scriptures. In fact, recently in General Conference, President Nelson said, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he says that everything that Christ experienced in Gethsemane was intensified on the cross. Sometimes what people will say is, what's really meaningful to me is Christ experiencing my pains. And that happened in Gethsemane. And I think from what President Nelson is teaching, whatever we're thinking about happening in Gethsemane is intensified 
on Calvary. And so this feelings of loneliness, abandonment, God, why have you forsaken me? Sometimes in our lives, when we feel forsaken, we can remember this moment as well on the cross as Jesus feels utterly abandoned, but continues to atone for us. And I, I love that idea that Jesus did not give up on us on the cross, and so he is not giving up on us today. Now, I think that, there, again, these multiple levels where um, it is a fulfillment of Scripture, prophets in both the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon have looked ahead and seen that, that Christ would be pierced for our transgressions. But it happened at a particular place at a particular time because the Romans used crucifixion mm -hmm. as a public means of execution for people who were, were, were threats to the empire. And so Christ is dying publicly as a criminal. He's not a criminal, but the point is that he is taking our place. He represents us. And so the fact that he not just suffers, but that he dies cut off from God. And so mm -hmm. this feeling of separation, part of it was there because when we separate ourselves from God, we die spiritually. And without him, that would be our eternally be our, our state. But because he died in our place, cut off from God, that we can be freed and we can be brought back and we don't have to be separated. And so we can, we can know that we're not alone because he did die alone for us. Sometimes we have to go through the dark time, the lonely time when, when we don't have comfort, but we can have confidence that, the, that comfort will come. You know, and it can be tough at times when, when you're in that moment uh, of despair at times it feels to know what to do. I would love to hear from the audience, what are some of the things that you do when you feel alone to close that gap? Anika. I am a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I felt something different about this church. So in 2009, I decided to go serve as a full-time missionary. And by then, everybody was against to my decision. They said, you can't go. We don't know anything about this church. And the day, the morning when I left my home to go to the MTC, I said bye to my family. And one of my brother, he, he said, because you choose this decision, I am not your brother anymore. So those feelings hurts me all the way coming to the States. And I was thinking, is this my wrong decision? You know, my family is not happy to me. But when I came to the Pro MTC, there was 2,500 missionaries from all over the world. They had amazing testimony. And I decided I will never give up. I will pray hard. You know, I will try to strengthen my testimony. And I felt like many times the Heavenly Father, He is there to help me with, you know, with all of my weaknesses. He can hear my prayers. And I know He's still there, you know, when I need, I pray and He's there. What an incredible testimony. Yeah, thinking about you know, what it might feel like to go on a mission and be, have no family support. Or, you know, tears came to my eyes as Claire was talking about being alone, you know, as a junior high or a high school student, like what that feels like. I think we can feel so much kinship with the Savior. And there's just a great comfort that comes when you know you're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, Neller Holland talks about this, about how in those times, and because of the suffering that Christ went through, we can turn to Him. He said, against all odds and with none to help or uphold him, Jesus of Nazareth, the living son of the living God, restored physical life where death had held sway and brought joyful spiritual redemption out of sin, hellish darkness, and despair. One of the great consolations is that because Jesus walks such a long, lonely path utterly alone, we do not have to do so. He took our estrangement and separation from God so that we could have a way to be made one again and reconciled. His solitary journey brought great company for our little version of that path. It gives us an example of, of the calling we have to, to take up the cross and follow him, mm -hmm. to be willing to, to walk a lonely road, but knowing that we're, we're following his footsteps and that, um, that he'll be with us. I, 
I'm I'm excited to continue this this conversation. I feel like we're we're really just getting into this. Um, but I'm so grateful for the experiences you shared and for the audience. What great examples of of how we are truly never alone uh, because of what Christ went through. And for you at home, how do you get closer to God when you have felt distant from Him? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. My favorite attribute of Jesus Christ is the pure love that He has for everybody. My favorite attribute to both of Jesus Christ is that He's all loving. No matter what, He loves everyone. No matter what you've been through, He will continue to be there for you. Um, there's no greater you know, gift than His love. There's nothing greater than love. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, he says there's faith, hope, and charity. There's all these great things, but the greatest is love. And maybe that's why it's Christ's love that resonates so much with me and with other people, because there's nothing greater than love and there's no greater love than He expressed through His death on the cross. Love is a, it's a fickle thing and uh, your emotions fluctuate. But what's impressive about Christ is He uh, was just so full of love all the time that He was able to keep that motivation and that uh, high performance. And I think that's one of my favorite aspects of Christ's character. So our second topic is what the crucifixion teaches me about the character of Christ. And before we jump into this topic, we're gonna to read a quote from Elder Bednar who talks about this and specifically a crucifixion, what we learn about the Savior from it. He says, character is demonstrated by looking and reaching outward when the natural and instinctive response is to be self-absorbed and turn inward. If such a capacity is indeed the ultimate criterion of moral character, then the savior of the world is the perfect example of such a consistent and charitable character. What does the crucifixion and Christ's suffering teach us about his character? Throughout his whole ministry, Christ is always looking outward and maybe we see this especially at the crucifixion. Maybe one way we can look at this is through the seven statements that Christ says from the cross. Matthew and Mark record one, there are three in Luke, and three in John. So because they're all in different gospel accounts, we don't know for sure what order they're in, but maybe okay. we can go through them in, a, in an approximate order and see how they show us Christ's character. So first in, in Luke chapter 23, I'm looking at verse 34, and I, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version with the church's handbook change. I find it helpful sometimes to read from different uh, Bible accounts. Okay. So then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And if we were to look at the Joseph Smith translation, it's specifically referring to the soldiers. So think about Christ literally in the act of being crucified, and he's still extending forgiveness to those who are in the act of harming him. So that's the first statement from the cross. Then a, a little while down, if we look in verse 39, one of the criminals that's being crucified next to Christ starts making fun of him and saying like, hey, why don't you just save all of us if you're really the Messiah? But then the other criminal says, no, this man has done nothing wrong. And he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, Jesus replied, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And when I was growing up, I always heard that verse almost like with a little asterisk saying like, well, you know, there's no such thing as deathbed repentance. You can't, you know, like really you're going to the spirit prison. But Joseph Smith, when he talked about this verse, he said that what Jesus is saying is today, I will be with you in the world of spirits and I will tell you all about it. And I love this act of mercy. Christ, it would be very easy, I think, for Christ to turn inward, to be like, mm -hmm. yeah, you got to worry about yourself, buddy. But he's reaching out, comforting, extending mercy to others on the cross, even holding out a hope that, yes, I personally will wow. teach you about this. Jennifer, what are some thoughts as we learn about something that for us is so natural to yeah. kind of hold grudges and, and not be as forgiving, especially in a moment like of suffering? Uh, what are some of your thoughts as we learn about his character from this experience? Yeah, I think that this this story in particular, both thinking about the soldiers and then thinking about the thief, that the Christ's divinity and his the, the godliness of his character of being outward focused. God is love. Like he is emanating, radiating love at a moment where he is going through this the 
this dark moment. He doesn't stop being who he is mm -hmm. no matter how hard things get. And I think that tells us something about even when we're going through hard times to, to keep remembering other people and to try to seek for help to not get lost in the darkness of what we might be experiencing, but to remember other people around us. And I think as we, we follow his example, we feel additional light and hope coming to, to look outwards and to care about other people. And that idea actually leads really well to the next statement that Christ uh, makes from the cross. I'm switching now to John chapter 19. If you look in verse 26, it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, which we often infer to be John, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And so we see, again, Christ in agony, not thinking about himself, but concerned for his mother, who will be taking care of her, reaching outwards when, as Elder Bednar said, the temptation would be to turn inward. So how do we handle that? You know, in, in society and the world today, we are, at times, we can be very self-centered and, and self-motivated. So how do we follow this example and, and try to transition from always looking inwardly, especially in, in when times are difficult and you may not be thinking as rationally as you might ordinarily and focus outward on the needs of others. I think, you know, this is one of the blessings of the covenant relationship we have we, every Sunday when we take the sacrament and we, we're covenanting again that we will always remember him. Mm -hmm. And I think remembering Christ on the cross is one of the powerful things about taking the sacrament is that we're, we're literally participating in receiving the benefits of his his death. So in his death, he's giving us life. And the, the promise that we receive is we'll always have his spirit to be with us. And so I think the more we can actively remember him through the week, in addition to concentrating while taking the sacrament, that we invite the Holy Ghost and our character starts to change. I'd love to hear some examples from the audience on how do you follow the example of Jesus Christ by focusing on the needs of others? Jacob. So in the beginning of um, 2022, I went through um, very dark times because of the bad choices I made. Um, during those times, I, you know, I felt depressed. I felt, you know, stressed out and um, almost suicidal. But um, as times went on, I realized that um, the things that I loved to do was to serve people. Um, serving people made me happy and made me forget the things that I, I really went through. Um, and we can see that even Jesus Christ, when he was going through, you know, the trials and everything, even onto the cross, because he knew his purpose and knew why he wanted to do this for us, that made him, you know, continue to do the things that he had to do in order to save us. So because of these um, lessons I've learned from him, um, I feel inspired to help people and serve them at all times so that I will forget the things that I'm going through. Jacob, I, I love that example and it fits so uh, perfectly with uh, what the Savior went through. You talked about feeling inspired to know uh, how to help and serve others. Uh, can you give us an example of what that inspiration looks like to you and how the Holy Ghost speaks to you? Yeah, the Holy Ghost speaks to speaks through me um, to be able to um, reach out to people that I feel like um, they need my help. Or when people reach out to me, I you know try my best to do the possible thing I can to help them with the things that they, they need. For example, in school, I had um, my friends were um, reaching out to me for help um, with an assignment. But during those times, I, I gave up on school. But I said, okay, well, even though I've quit school, I, I've given up, I still need to be there for these people because they need my help. And um, during those times, it helped me get back to school again. And I felt the need to continue helping people so that I can forget through my pain. You know, that's a great example of, of really what the Savior is demonstrating, that even when, when we are struggling or going through things, we can be lifted through the service of others. Um, so what other aspects, in addition to reaching out, serving, looking out for the interests of others, uh, we talked about there are seven mm -hmm. uh, statements. What else do we learn about this experience on the cross? So we've looked at the first three. Uh, the next two, one in John chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus says, I am thirsty, or the King James says, I thirst. And I think this, along with the next one, which we talked about earlier, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
These really show us the human savior. Mm -hmm. He understands what it means to be physically thirsty. In fact, President Nelson um, highlighted that as a physician, you know that as a patient is an extreme shock, extreme thirst is a part of their condition. And maybe we see that Jesus who had said, those who drink of the water I give them will never thirst. Maybe in his thirst, he's quenching our thirst, our thirst to know that we're not alone. And then in the final two statements, um, maybe we could look first, uh, going back to Luke chapter 23, verse uh, 46. Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And thinking about it, in Luke, the very first words we hear Jesus say, it's when he's 12 years old at the temple and his parents are like, what, what have you been doing? And he said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? And then here, the last words we hear the mortal Christ say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Just this core focus of Jesus doing the Father's will. I think that's a key part of his character. He never stops. And then this last phrase in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus says, it is finished. And earlier in the Gospels, he had said, my work is to do the work my Father sent me. And now he has finished it. And I think that's an amazing part of Christ's character. Jennifer, as you as we talk about these these seven statements, is there anyone in particular that, that connects with you on a personal level that you feel like you've learned and 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 made some changes uh, or character building of your own? Looking at John nineteen, where his mother is going to outlive him, and so she had known from the time he was an infant of something going to happen, and here we see this sort of her heart being pierced through a pain that no one other than her had to bear. Um, and then I think every person has pain that's unique to them. And I think his capacity to, to recognize the individual and an individual's pain is a model for me of, of, try, of something to aspire to, mm -hmm. something to keep working towards, of, of recognizing that every person has pain that's unique to them and to, to do something to recognize it and to help them feel cared for um, as an individual. You know, John, you, you wrote a book about this, and I'm sure you learned so many valuable lessons from, you know, the academic or the scholarly side. How about on a personal level? What was it like for you to, to do the study, do the research, and how has that changed your character as you've learned about the character of Christ? Honestly, studying Christ's death has changed my life. For the very things that we've been talking about, the more you immerse yourself in Christ's final 24 hours— I think we'd all agree, the more you know about Christ, the more you love him, and the more you love him, the more you wanna be like him. And, and it's just in these few minutes, we've been focused on the death of Christ. There might be some people thinking to themselves, well, but wait, don't we believe in the living Christ? And of course we believe in the living Christ. Without the living Christ, we would have no hope. At the same time, we believe in the loving Christ. Mm. And Jesus himself said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So today we've been talking about the event that Jesus himself defined as his greatest act of love. And it's not a competition. It's not, is it the living Christ or the loving Christ? It's both. And as we study this act that Christ defined as his greatest act of love, for, for me, it has changed me. Yeah. And I believe it will change anyone who embarks on that study. Well, I look forward to, to really getting into a lot more of these, these topics and these statements uh, later on, the footnotes version of the show. But thank you so much for your experiences. It's been uh, wonderful to feel uh, of the spirit that you bring to this conversation. So thank you so much. And for those at home, we still have so much to cover from these passages regarding Christ's suffering and atonement with Jennifer and John in footnotes. Stay tuned. One thing that touched me today was to hear Claire, a young woman, talk about feeling completely alone. She has to get a new friend group. And it's just a reminder that whatever life stage we're in, there are going to be times that are difficult and challenging. And sometimes they're solved quickly and sometimes they last for decades. I liked what Claire said because of like switching friend groups because I've had to go through that before. And it took me like a while and I was kind of on my own. To think about that real life scenario that she described and how Christ comforted her, just as a reminder that Christ will comfort me in my times of distress. He served everyone, and that to me is what strengthens us and uplifts us and helps us to build one another. We're here, I believe, to serve, and when we have His example, we just want to follow that.
Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about passages from Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19 with Jennifer and John. All righty. Well, thank you, first of all, for the wonderful discussions that we've had. I'm, I'm excited to go in and learn and study more based off of what we talked about. We've been talking about Christ, the crucifixion. Why has there, particularly among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, why in our culture has there been this stigma about the crucifix? Mm, that's a great question. So in just to define terms, there's the crucifix, which would be a cross with Christ hanging on the cross, and then also just an empty cross. And typically within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you don't see crosses or crucifixes in our building. Mm -hmm. I think if you were to ask the average member of the church, why don't you guys use the cross? They would probably paraphrase a statement that President Hinckley gave in 1975. He had given a tour of the Mesa, Arizona temple to a Protestant minister. And the Protestant minister said, I didn't see any crosses in your temple. And President Hinckley said to us, the cross is a symbol of the dying Christ. And we believe in the living Christ. And I think it's important for us to remember that President Hinckley said that in 1975, and sometimes the way that we talk about mm -hmm. specific issues can change over time. And to be really clear, there's President Hinckley was talking about the institutional church, what the church chooses to put in a temple, for example. Okay. But there's never been a statement made in general conference. There's never been a, a statement in an official church handbook that says Latter-day Saints as individuals are forbidden from wearing a cross necklace or wearing a crucifix. And by the way, Ben, I happen to know that you yourself wear a crucifix often. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, yeah. I, I yeah, I wear a crucifix necklace uh, regularly, and it, there was a moment where um, I was really uncomfortable uh, with uh, seeing something that is so sacred and, and, and an event that was so um, poignant in the life of, of of my life and in the life of the Savior, and how it just. It meant so much uh, what he did for me on that cross. I, I was really uncomfortable with why is why am I looking at something that is so precious and there's this negative stigma attached mm. to it. And I wanted to change that. And so I really started paying attention and I started looking at images in a different light. And, and so I just decided, you know what, I'm really gonna try to change that culture among you know people that I know. And so I started wearing one and I love it. I play with it, you know, when I'm kind of sitting around. And it just is that constant reminder of what was done for me mm. on a personal level. It's nothing that I advertise out there to everybody to see. It is something that I've just chosen. You know, we, we, we look at symbols a lot in our culture and they have special meaning. Um, and so that is one that I, I, I hold dear and I use as a reminder of my devotion to him. And I think it's interesting how you point out culture. A lot of people might be surprised to know that back in the days of Brigham Young, there are numerous Latter-day Saints who are photographed wearing cross mm. necklaces, cross earrings. I did my dissertation research on late medieval passion piety, and so I myself have a, a wide collection of crosses and crucifix, and we love them because they're beautiful. We love them because we have a shared faith with so many Christians mm -hmm. around the world. Seeing and spending so much time looking at these images of Christ and his suffering and his passion turned my heart more and more to him. Mm. I think the average Latter-day Saint, if they were to see an, uh, maybe a lot of images of mm -hmm. the crucifixion, especially some of these medieval ones, they'd be like, oh, no, I, I don't like that. And if I remember right from your book on the subject, you yourself kind of experienced at least initially a little bit of like, oh, this is different, but then it, it came to speak to you. It takes time. It just like, Because it is cultural, that you, you move into a new culture and things are unfamiliar at first, but then gradually you realize, oh, I'm comfortable, I, I've grown to understand. It's like it's a language, a way to think about Christ, a way to remember Christ. And I think it just offers up op opportunities to be multilingual yeah. so that we can love and, and worship Christ and remember him when we're in our simple plain chapels, and we're, but we're partaking the sacrament. We're looking at those emblems that point us to Christ and that point us to the crucifixion. And in our homes, however we choose to remember him, that, that there are these options that we have that can help us um, to, mm. to keep that covenant promise we make to always remember him. There's so many other things from these chapters uh, that we're studying this week. 
Uh, John, do you want to kind of guide us through some of the things that stand out to you from this week? Are there any things, uh, any principles that we want to go back to as far as the seven statements are concerned? Yeah, you know, maybe we could start back with the trial. Okay. Uh, Jesus standing trial before Pilate. And I'm, I'm turning to John chapter 19. If we maybe just pick up the last uh, few verses of John chapter 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask me this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So we start to see that it's not really that Jesus is on trial before Pilate. In a sense, Pilate is on trial before Jesus. Mm. Jesus is teaching Pilate. And this next phrase, Pilate asked, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate's ironic response is, what is truth? Just a few hours earlier, Jesus had said at the Last Supper, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the capital T, truth, is here talking to Pilate, and Pilate either can't or won't recognize it. I think this really does tell us like you said, more about Pilate, where he is struggling to live up to what he feels is right and ultimately is going to decide that political expediency is more important to him. Mm -hmm. And so I think this statement is really speaking to that, that I'm a political leader. I can't afford to deal with a question of what is real, what is mm -hmm. true. I, I, I mean, he's, he's brushing it aside because Christ, I think he feels something from him. At least that's my sense, that he feels something but that he he doesn't want to have to to take that into his calculations. He just wants to keep good relations with the, the leaders of the Jews so that they can have a stable sort of status quo, that, that things will stay the same and that that this is a sort of a real politique. He's not he's just not interested in the truth. And I think that that, that is a, it's a sobering thing because we live in an era where sometimes that is the case as well, that people just want what's expedient rather than what's true. And Christ is always there to point us to, to truth because he is the truth. But we might be tempted to do what Pilate does and, and to say, you know, that, that I don't want to, to make changes to my life. I would rather just ignore that question. Yeah. And and it's interesting, you're right, Pilate multiple times says, I don't find any fault yeah. in Jesus. He's clearly trying to back away. But what changes the tide mm -hmm. is in verse 12 of chapter yeah. 19. Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself on the emperor. Like all people in the scriptures, Pilate has a backstory. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't know his backstory. The ancient uh, historians, Josephus and Philo, tell us some stories that basically show that Pilate has already had a few negative run-ins with the Jewish authorities. They've already written to the emperor to complain about him before, and Pilate got in trouble. So the timing is not 100% clear on whether those stories happened before or after this one, but it's very possible that there's kind of a veiled threat here that's saying, hey, Pilate, do you remember? Like, we've written to the emperor before. This man, Jesus, is claiming to be a king. Mm -hmm. We're going to write him and say, you're not doing anything about this. That's going to look bad for Pilate. And I think we see the ultimate test of peer pressure. Yeah. And Pilate buckles. Right. And he, he wants to save his skin. He wants yeah. to save his position. And he's willing to do whatever it takes in order to not get in trouble. And, and uh, historically, Christian history has not been kind to Pilate. We kind of view him as this horrible, evil person. But like you said, he has a backstory. And I think sometimes we can jump to conclusions and say, well, you, you should have done this. You should have done this. Um, at least at minimum, we can kind of say, well, at least I can understand where he, his point of view and where he was coming from and the fear that he had, you know, had he chosen to, to release Jesus. And, and that's actually helpful in understanding the leaders of the Jews as well. Um, because sometimes we do, and this has happened through Christian history, to turn all of these people into monsters. Mm. But to know that, that they are living in these political realities where they're, they're I think they're all compromising um, what they 
feel it would be a better way, but they're doing it, they're justifying it to themselves. John, I've always had this question of, if you look in chapter 19, verse 19, uh, is there anything we can take away from, after all this experience with Pilate and wanting to release Jesus, kind of this, I feel like there's this wrestle that he's going through. And then when the decision is made to turn him over to, to the mob, in verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Is there any significance to um, the, the the fact that it was Pilate who wrote this title and put it on there? Is that kind of is, is he proclaiming anything that he learned through this process of interviewing Jesus? So I think that's a one of those times where the scriptures can probably speak to us in different ways. One way that often scholars will view this is Pilate's kind of just sticking it to the Jewish authorities. He's he's okay. upset that they've backed him into a corner. Okay. So, and that's why you see in the following verses, the chief priests are like, well, don't write that he was the king of the Jews, just that it. he said he was. Okay. And Pilate, nope, I've written it. Now, you could also view that as Pilate is one of the first Christian missionaries. Yeah, like what and if he he's bearing his every, testimony yeah. saying, like, this is my declaration, my self declaration. And he's doing it in multiple languages, right? He's yeah. he's going to all the world. So I think we could see it in both those ways. And maybe like with all of these things we've been talking about, we, we can't know Caiaphas's right. motives. Mm -hmm. We can't know Pilate's motives, but we can kind of look inward and say, Lord, is it I? Are there ever yeah. times when I'm going to compromise on my beliefs yeah. for expediency? And yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn my back on you a little bit, Jesus, because boy, this is a tough situation. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the warnings. And I think that's one of the power of these stories is that we don't get the message of the warning if we turn the people into, make them, that they're not human. Mm. And the more we can see them as humans who are making decisions that are selfish and self-serving, but that actually is very much as we can often be, and then not living up to the truth that we have because it's uncomfortable, it's embarrassing, it might we might lose opportunities if we're true to what we know. And I think that as we can see them doing that, we can recognize, we can say, mm -hmm. how am I doing things that are like that to not be, be true to the truth? Jennifer, you've been using the phrase, the passion. Right. That's the phrase that maybe not all Latter-day Saints or even other Christians always use. What, yeah. what do you mean when you say the passion? Well, and the, the root, passio, just means to suffer. And so it's it's his suffering. We, we use the term, the language, maybe the atoning sacrifice, mm. to kind of use to talk about Gethsemane to the cross. When we use the term atonement, it actually can take in even more because that where we can include Gethsemane, and the cross and the resurrection, because mm. atonement is all of those things. The passion is the term is used by other Christians, typically runs sort of all of the suffering that he went through during that last 24 hours of his life. Thanks for asking that, because I was yeah. wanting the same thing, you know, to have that sort of clarification and where yeah. that that comes from. Uh, John, what else can you teach us about not only the the suffering? On the cross, but even those those events leading up to it, you know, we have Simon mm -hmm. uh, bear, being asked to carry the cross. Is there any details you can give us to kind of help us understand this um, this whole event? Yeah, one of the greatest things that I think any one of us or our viewers could do is to carefully read these chapters side by side and look for similarities and differences. Simon's a great example because there's a, one or two verses about him in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and there's none in John. And so to look carefully for why are there these similarities and differences can be really powerful. So for example, um, in Luke's version, if we look at Luke chapter 23, there's just a little phrase about Simon that's not in the others. So it's Luke chapter 23, verse 26. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. I think the King James says following mm -hmm. Jesus. And I think that's really interesting because you see that Jesus is in the lead and Simon is behind him following Jesus. And earlier in his ministry, Jesus had talked about people carrying their cross and following him. So Luke is kind of highlighting Simon is carrying a heavy burden, but he's doing it following Jesus. And I can think about my own burdens that I'm carrying. Am I carrying those in the act of following Jesus. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. a difference between having a burden and you're kind of like fighting through it on your own versus I'm carrying it following Jesus. 
You know, I never thought about that. So I, I love that image of what that means, carrying your burdens, heading in that right direction. Sorry, keep going. This is, I love this. So every gospel account has a slightly different emphasis. For example, Mark really tends to focus on human aspects of Jesus Christ. It's in Mark where we hear Jesus on the cross saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? John has a tendency to focus more on the divine aspects of Christ. And so it's interesting if you go back and read through John chapter 19, look at verse 16, how it's different. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to the place of the skull. So John uh, apparently deliberately eliminates Simon from the mm -hmm. account. And I don't think like that what's important isn't like, well, wait, was Simon there? Was he not there? What's important is that each gospel author really wants to highlight a certain aspect of Christ's character. And throughout his account, John wants to show that Jesus Christ is all powerful. He's always, he's always existed. He's always in control. It really does help when we see them, each of these gospels as witnesses and that they're not necessarily competing, but they're complementing mm. each other. It's like when we listen to the apostles, each of them are speaking from their lived experience and so how they emphasize things, how they talk about things may be different, but they're all pointing to Christ and testifying of Christ. And so like the, all those different facets of a diamond, we have more mm. illumination and that adding them together, we end up with more than if we just were to have one. I'd say read these four chapters that we're studying today, but read them in small chunks, looking very carefully for what the different authors say about a specific event like Simon. And the similarities and differences can really illuminate some powerful principles. That's neat. Yeah. Uh, what is this term? Uh, I've heard this term when we talk about these events, the Via de la Rosa. Mm. Uh, can we explain this and what it means and how it fits in with this narrative? Yeah, having studied sort of like in the late medieval, early modern, the, the modern practice of following this way of sorrow is the, the translation of that um, is, a, is more recent. So it's like a 16th century development, but it's based on scriptural text. And what happened is that originally people, well, leading up to the late Middle Ages, would go to the, the holy places as pilgrims, but it was kind of random. They, they would see, here's an Old Testament site, there's a New Testament site, it's all mixed together. And then later on, it kind of developed where the Franciscans wanted to help people ponder and think about the passion, and so they would lead them through the steps. And so this is a gradual process. And our friends who are familiar with or have practiced themselves as Catholics, you'll go into churches and you'll see these steps, um, the way of the cross or the stations of the cross in almost every Catholic church. And that many of them may not come from the Bible, but they, they point to a, a practice of pondering and meditating on, again, it's a way to always remember the love that he had, that he showed for us in following that journey. And so that's kind of the, his, the history of where the Via Dolorosa comes from. But then there's a biblical dimension right. that it's rooted in. And if you were to go to Jerusalem today, you would find a, a street sign that says Via Dolorosa and a path that people walk. And that's probably not historically accurate, mm -hmm. but the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, really is about the path Jesus takes from Pilate's headquarters to the cross. And that is historically real. Jesus really does go to the cross. Mm -hmm. And along the way, there's, there's later... Christian traditions, but in scripture, uh, Simon carrying the cross is one event. And then another major event is mentioned in Luke chapter 23. Um, it's in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 27. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me but weep for yourselves and for your children. And he goes on to make a prophecy about what will be happening in the following generation. And this is an example of what we talked about earlier, I think, with the character of Christ. Here, Jesus is under extreme duress and pain. And he could have said, oh, hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate your support. You know, it's all about me. But he doesn't. He turns outward. Don't weep for me. And he's concerned about them and what will happen to them and to their children. So I think on the Via Dolorosa, we see Christ's character as he looks outward to others. You know, something that we haven't talked about much um, is the perspective from the apostles and, and kind of what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we learned through this, uh, through these chapters about 
you know, what they were going through during this process, you know, uh, leading up to the crucifixion and even the burial that could be beneficial to us. I was going to say, if I can tweak your question a little bit, because you asked about the apostles, but the apostles are scarcely mentioned. In fact, no male disciple is mentioned by name as being at the cross. Really? However, multiple women disciples are. <laughs> Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, several others are named. And then it also says, and many others were there. We sometimes feel sad or disappointed. We don't have as many uh, voices of women in scriptures, but I think looking at this here and seeing their presence, that like who shows up, who and, is and, there. And when at those, right. at those crucial moments. Yeah, that they're, they are there with him. And even as he is suffering with us, that that willingness to, to be there, to be that support, just as he felt maybe in the garden abandoned but seeing these women, I think that that's a witness, even without their words, that they're they're showing us the love they have for him and their their devotion, their dedication to be there. It what it must have been like, unimaginably excruciating to watch someone you love so much um, going through this slow process of dying. And another lesson with that, I think, is so often some of the greatest experiences of pain we feel is when someone we love is suffering. So a loved one is sick, a loved one is making bad choices. I can't do anything to change it. Mm -hmm. That's how helpless. these women feel. These women are helpless at the cross, but they still stayed. Yeah. They still supported. And that's a, that can, I think, be helpful for me is kind of to look at my scriptural forebears and these women at the cross and say, okay, I, I can't solve your pain. I can't change everything, but I can be here. Well, thank you. Jennifer, any last thoughts as we talked about Christ and the crucifixion that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I think from whether the pre-mortal Jehovah or the glorious King of Kings who will return, he is um, the truth. He is the life. He is the way. And this is why I think it's such a, a, a rich blessing to, to study this text, because it was all pointing to this or all coming from this, that everything that he has, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was his mission. To this end was I born. He came to do this. We will be able to receive the fullness because of the gift that he gave us of his atoning sacrifice. And so the, the restoration for me is the blessing of being able to, to partake and receive the blessings of his atoning sacrifice with the ordinances, they all point to Christ and they they point to his crucifixion. Ben, if I could just say something to add to what Jennifer said even more explicitly, for Latter-day Saints who have been to the temple and received their endowment, or if you've been to a sealing ceremony, you can see really clearly that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is central in the endowment. Mm -hmm. It's literally at the center of a sealing ceremony. And then I think the more we come to then understand and love and appreciate the Savior's atonement, the more these ordinances become meaningful for us as well. You know, John, as you've dedicated so much of your life, uh, you know, writing your book and just all the effort and study, what was that process like for you? What was the progression of your testimony as you've put in so much time to study about the life of the Savior? I think I can best answer that question with a quote from President James E. Faust. He said, the more we understand any aspect of the Savior's atonement, the more we will be drawn to him. And in my life, I had studied a lot of the resurrection. I had studied a lot about the Garden of Gethsemane, but I had almost just skipped over the crucifixion mm -hmm. for some of the reasons that we've been talking about today. And so for me, as I was able and continue to dive deep into just really understanding every scriptural detail and other details that we can learn from other historical sources about Christ's crucifixion. I'm learning more about Christ's atonement and as a result, drawing closer to him. Yesterday, I was talking to my father-in-law and he said, you get to meet with some of the most brilliant scholars and guests. He's, and he asked me, he says, what has that done for you personally? My response was, it gives me the desire to want to go and study and learn more for mm -hmm. myself. So I can't thank you enough for, for providing this opportunity for us to learn and grow and for sharing your, your work, your experience, and your testimonies uh, with us today. Thank you both so very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And for those at home, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions that you've received. As always, you can find much more from this episode and others at byutv.org slash come follow up. Next week, we rejoice in the risen Lord and share insights into the resurrection of Jesus Christ as we read from Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John chapters 20 through 21. Thank you for watching.